Hey there, Zoomzy here, and I don't know about you, but I am so ready for sweater weather. But before I say goodbye to August just yet, I do want to wrap up what sort of literary and horror and uh, literary horror books that I've read recently. Starting off with a cosmic horror novella recommended by Florence Welch herself, and in case you don't know who that is, that is the goddess, the lead singer of Florence and the Machine. She recommended this one and it did not disappoint. It watered my crops and it brought me out of a bad reading drought and I am talking about Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Arnfield. The story centers around a married couple. We have Leia and Mary. Leia is a scientist who goes off on a deep sea expedition and when she comes back she's changed and she keeps leaving like a weird residue behind in the bathtub and the water bill is skyrocketing and her wife Mary is left trying to cope with the changes and trying to find answers. Yes, there are speculative elements to the story, but its true heart and what made it feel so compelling to me is that at its core, this is a story about a couple who's becoming more estranged and more emotionally distant from each other. And in fact, the themes reminded me a lot of Echo, which also uses cosmic horror to deal with like this estranged otherness, like, oh, you can't kind of relate to your spouse anymore. And I just thought it was so beautifully and poignantly done. So I cannot recommend it enough if you're looking for like an emotionally driven sci-fi. And the next one is a little bit hard to categorize, but I'd probably best describe it as a literary historical with some supernatural elements. It's called Briefly a Delicious Life by Nell Stevens, and the story follows a gay ghost named Blanca who haunts a Italian monastery. And she's kind of a peeping Tom, and she can also like move objects. She's a poltergeist. So she screws around and freaks out the priests. However, her life gets more interesting as the centuries pass and the monastery starts like renting out rooms to whoever wants to be inspired by a monastery. So a novelist named George Sand and some composer named Chopin move in and yes, George Sand is a real-life novelist and the composer Chopin. If you don't know him, he's a pianist and composer. He's fantastic. So those people move in and she's like captivated by them. And this was such a beautiful and unique ghost story. And this story might not be for everyone. It doesn't have much of a forward-moving plot and climax. It's very introspective. And it's basically Blanca just watching pieces of people's lives. So if you want more of like a thinker sort of story, you'll have a good time with this one. Next, I want to talk about Sirens and Muses by Antonia Ingris. And I think I went into this one with different expectations. I was expecting more of a dark academia. And this one is just more like dull academia and it centers around the lives of various art students at a prestigious art college and <laughs> I think I was kind of thinking that it was going to be more like Black Swan, highly competitive like artists going to extremes to one-up each other and instead they're just kind of lounging around arguing about art theory and some of their art projects for college art students sounded awful like one guy he printed out a logo of puma and he just did that and he named it a name after um let's just say it's slang for cat and slang for a certain body part and i beg your pardon but that just seems like something that a high school student would do the night before an art project was due. Like, that's lazy. <laughs> so yeah. Next we have a sort of retelling mashup called Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Kista. And this one follows two kind of sidelined women of literary books. So it follows 
Bertha Mason, who is <laughs> Mr. Rochester's wife, who he kept in the attic. And then it follows Lucy from Dracula, who is Mina's friend, and she gets turned into a vampire. So it follows those two women. Both of them are immortal, like Lucy, because she's a vampire. And then Bertha, for reasons that are explained later in our spoilery, she's immortal in her own way as well. And they kind of unite and band together and bond over shared trauma. And that was really sweet to read. Really, that was the best part of the book for me. And what I didn't like, and I'm going to be upfront here and say that I am partially biased here because Jane Eyre is one of my favorite classics of all time. And I didn't like how this book handle Jane Eyre's character or Mr. Rochester's. They were unrecognizable to me and this book explains it by saying like, oh, Jane Eyre was a fabricated tale from Mr. Rochester's perspective. He made her write it like that to make him look good. And I feel like that excuse kind of diminishes the complexity of Jane Eyre's character as well as Mr. Rochester's. And I think like the author maybe wanted to like lift Bertha up and make her look better, but you don't have to screw over other characters to flesh another one out. There's none of Jane Eyre's original spirit. She's just this cowering victim, and I feel like that portrayal of Jane undermines the story's own themes of like empowering women. I, I don't understand that narrative choice. And then there's Mr. Rochester, who is portrayed as this evil, diabolical villain who somehow managed to accumulate this, like, entire commune full of women who he's manipulated. And I do want to point out at this point that this book is supposed to take place in San Francisco during the 60s. So I feel like it was almost a missed opportunity not to turn Mr. Rochester into this charismatic cult leader, that would be more believable because I don't know how on earth he's managed to woo all these women and manipulate them when he has a personality of a wet blanket. Like there's none of that spark or snark that I loved so much in Jane Eyre and it's a shame. I do feel like though this book did manage to capture Dracula. He's more believable of a villain because he's seductive and he's like whispering um, from his ashes that Lucy keeps. So I understand the sway that he has over her. That makes sense to me. Mr. Rochester, like, I don't know what happened to him. He got the short end of the stick here. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna calm down now because I was getting worked up because Jane Eyre is a really beloved story for me and I feel like my image of what the characters are supposed to be may be gone in the way of reluctant immortals interpretation of them a little bit. I see that a lot of people enjoyed this story more than me so maybe you will too. Okay next we have a summer camp slash folk horror by Julia Lynn Rubin and this story follows Arlie who's brought by her mother to this famous all-girls camp called Camp Rockaway. However, when she arrives, she can't help but shake the feeling that something or somebody is watching her, and things start getting really weird and culty, and it seems like they worship horses. <laughs> and this book really delivers on the creepy crawlies. There's like maggots and all this gross stuff. Like honestly, I was surprised by how gross this book is because I read extreme horror and I read splatterpunk. However, this book has one scene involving a baby horse fetus that made me nauseous. So congrats on the disgusting factor if you want something outright disgusting. <laughs> However, I don't think I like the end direction this story took. I'm going to try to be vague to avoid spoilers, but I was hoping that it was ultimately going to be about her going feral. I was hoping for more like a yellow jacket situation where people embrace their inner animal to survive. 
But this ending felt like such a cop-out that undermined the story's own themes. I was almost feeling like it was setting up for a sequel, but I was left really unsatisfied. Okay, last but not least, we have a dystopian that I did actually absolutely adore, and that is Dayboy by Trent Jamieson, and the story is set in the post-apocalyptic future where the world is ruled by immortal vampire-like beings called masters, and they basically protect their towns in exchange from getting a little bit of blood from them. However, these masters are vulnerable during the day, they turn into stone, so they require servants called dayboys to do their tasks and chores for them, and one of these dayboys is named Mark. We get the story from his perspective, and he's left with an uncertain future as like civil unrest starts to grow in the cities and the town folk start wanting to maybe overthrow the masters so his whole life as he knows it starts toppling. Yeah, the world building was just so immersive and so well done and the narrator's voice was really strong and just kind of grabs a hold of you and doesn't let go so I was really pleasantly surprised by this one. All right, that's a wrap. If you've read any good books lately, let me know down below. And I'm also super excited for the releases that are coming out next month. In September, like House of Hunger is coming out and it's basically kind of like about blood maids serving a vampire countess or nobility of some sort. And the premise reminds me kind of of Lady D from Resident Evil Village. So I'm so excited for that one. And I do really hope to do a review for that. So stay tuned for that. As always, thank you for watching and I'll catch you later.